Well, welcome to all of you. It's fantastic to have so many of you online again tonight. It's uh, what a wonderful day down here in Nice now. I've actually just come back from Cape Town this morning. The weather's been awesome down in uh, in Cape Town, so it's really, really great. But summer seems to be on its way. For those of you on tonight, I really we've got some uh, quite a lot to share with you. Quite a lot of treats in uh, in store, and also some surprises in terms of where we are and what it is that we're doing. If you do have any questions, please just fire them through in the question box so we can be as interactive as possible. You all know that. Uh, the more interactive you are on these webinars, the more actually you'll get out of the webinar in terms of where we actually are. Now, I can see from the people that are online, there's a number of people that have necessarily been you know, to some of our events before or heard us talk in terms of where we are. So tonight is a blend of who we are, where we are, why we're investing in America, the type of results we're getting there, and also in terms of the opportunities and how to take advantage in terms of where they actually are and why it is that we're there. I've uh, shown quite a few people this uh, this quote before in terms of why we're here today. And Nelson Mandela said, money won't create success, the freedom to make it will. And I think one of the most important things for me in terms of my background and my understanding and, and where my family comes from is that it's taking what Nelson Mandela says and just taking it to another level because it's not just the freedom to make money, it's the freedom to create global wealth because that freedom will ultimately determine you know, what school your children can go to, what university they can go to, where you can go on holiday, where you can live. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm a passionate South African, but I truly believe that what the greatest freedom is, is being able to make any choice that you actually want, no matter where it is. So it's taking what Nelson Mandela says, and it's taking it to another level in terms of actually being able to create global wealth is the freedom in terms of where it is. Now, as my interest, some of you have seen this before. What is CPI? What is CPI and what does it stand for? Come on, this is your time to be actively involved and participate. The more you participate, the more you're going to get out of this webinar. So please tell me, what is uh, the CPI? What does it stand for? And uh, if you know what it is, tell me how it's calculated. So I'm going to wait and see how many people are paying attention here and let them know. You can tell me what it actually is and what you think it is. Sure, tough crowd tonight. We uh, we're struggling to get uh, to get people's attention here, but uh, I can see a number of people. Rion, Clive, Graham, Pierre have all said consumer price index. Clive said it's a basket of goods bought on an average by a person. Uh, that's exactly right, Clive. So what it basically is, and the way that's calculated is every month there's actually 20 items that they put in a basket of goods in terms of where it is. Now, just to understand in terms of how our global wealth is affected, we actually created the GWI, which is the Global Wealth Index. And some of you would have actually seen this in terms of the research that we did for, for our book that we've just launched. But just as a matter of interest, if you take a basket of goods, so we said a family holiday to Disney World, a family holiday going skiing in a French resort, a private school, uh, we went with Churchy in Brisbane, which is the similar of, of St. Stithians or Bishops or Hilton, a Harvard uh, year uh, tuition. Now, the whole logic behind that is that your kid won't necessarily go to Harvard but you certainly want to have the freedom to send them to whatever you know university they want to go to. And then ultimately, I'm not sure if you know, but you can buy your way into to America and to Australia. And people don't understand that. They don't understand the numbers. So what are the numbers in terms of actually just buying your way in should you want to go and live in one of those countries? So let's look at some of these numbers. Do you know that in 1983, to go on a, a family holiday for a week with a mom and a dad and two kids, how much do you think it would have cost you? in 1983 in dollar terms. So the answer is $715. Now what about the rand? If you had one pound in 1983, how many rands would you get for that pound? Anyone? Do you think the rand was more valuable or less valuable than the pound? Well the answer is 82 cents. You would get 82 cents for one pound. So the rand was actually stronger than the pound. In 1993, if you had one dollar, how much would you actually get for that one dollar in rand terms in 1993? Well, the answer is three rand and seven cents. 
And then as a matter of interest, how much do you think it would cost to send your kid to a private school? So churchy, which is, as I said, the equivalent of bishops or saints. This is for a day boy. It's not for a boarder. And it's for the yearly tuition in Aussie dollars. What do you, what do you think it would cost? And the answer is $39,000, 356. So roughly 40,000 Australian dollars. And uh, in Rand terms, you know, that's just short of 400,000 Rand for the year. And then lastly, if you want to immigrate to Australia at the moment, how much does it actually cost you to immigrate to Australia? So you can buy your way in. It used to cost uh, quite a lot less, but this year it is currently 1.5 million Aussie dollars. So the big question is, what has happened to our global wealth index and what has happened to our global wealth in terms of the last 30 years? And the really frightening statistic is that we have actually devalued by 77% a year in terms of a straight line graph. If you take compound interest into account, we've actually devalued by 29.5% every single year, compounding on top of itself for the last 30 years. Now, a lot of people say to me, well, why is that and, and what is the plan? Well, the one problem is, is that first world assets and first world costs are going up, but also the RAND is devaluing. If you look at this graph from 1990 to today, the RAND is devalued. You can see that it's actually gone up and down. It's spiked up and down. But as a long-term trend, it is devalued by 5.6% every single year. The scary statistic is that if you take the last 30 years, it's actually over 6% every single year. So if you're a South African and you're saying to me, well, Scott, I can get much better assets and uh, much better returns in my assets in South Africa. I go, fair enough. But are you taking into account this 5.6 to 6% margin that year on year has happened as a long-term trend? And the question is, do you think it's going to change? I mean, we work with a partner and a, and a sophisticated guy called James Painter. He actually is a researcher for the RAND. We've been working with him for a long time. He's been tracking the RAND against the US dollar since 2005 and forecasting where it's going to go. He uses some pretty sophisticated technology. And he's had an 81% accuracy in predicting where the RAND is going to go since 2005. Now, when you consider where the RAND is at the moment and how volatile it has been for the last 10 years. It's pretty accurate and pretty unique for someone to have an accuracy of over 80%. Now, if you are interested, if you want to put in there asset manager, if you literally type it in asset manager, then one of the asset managers can send you this report. We've got the latest RAND report. Actually, at the moment, he says that now is a good time in terms of the RAND and, and where the RAND is in terms of strength. He sees it weakening over the next couple of weeks and, and the next couple of months. And in the next couple of years, he actually sees us going to a target range of 14 Rand to 21 against the US dollar. Now, what's very interesting is that 14 to 21, I asked him what the probability was, and he said there's more than a 90% probability. So if you're interested in getting this report, please just type in asset manager. And one of the asset managers will actually get back to you and, and give you the report. But these are the type of sophisticated people that we work with to make sure that our results and our predictions and our, and our, and our decisions are not just based on gut feeling. They're actually based on research. A lot of people say to me, well, Scott, what do you do? And I've actually got a webinar on this. It's recorded if you are interested where about a month ago, I went into a whole lot of different scenarios to show people. Now, you, you're not meant to be able to see these numbers. Um, it's all a lot of scenarios that I actually went out and, and, and put in place. But in terms of the graphs, just to give you some idea, the light blue line is if you put your money in the bank in South Africa, based on the last 30-year trend, if you were to put that forward by 30 years, forecast it forward, your net asset value would be here probably about 200, 220,000 US dollars. If you were to buy a good South African property, now a good South African property, if you take the last 30-year trends, is an 8% net yield with 12% capital growth. Those are the long-term trends. And your net asset value in 30 years would be about $700,000. If you were to wait for a year because you say, nope, the rand is 10 rand to the dollar, and I think it's wrong, it's going to be a lot weaker in, in a year's time, it's going to be, sorry, stronger, it's going to be 9 rand to the dollar. But you wait for a year and then you invest. Your net asset value based on the 30-year trend would be about $2 million if you bought an American property based on long-term trends. If you bought today at, a 10, you know, at the 10 rand to the dollar, but you benefit from the passive income 
for the last literally 30 years. You'll be 10% better off in the long term. And actually, your net asset value will be about 2.2, 2.3 million. And then finally, if you take into account the impact of gearing and buying a good American property, but with gearing, your net asset value would be actually above $4 million. And what a lot of people don't understand is that the net difference between that is that if you invest between leaving your money in the bank in South Africa and investing in a good American property is 1,634%. The difference between buying a good South African property and a good American property based on the last 30 years in terms of trends and forecasting it forward by 30 years is 439%. Now, 77% per year is 2,300%. And if you divide that by 439, it equals 5.2 houses. That is how you fix the Global Wealth Index. That is how you keep your global wealth intact. Because by owning 5.2 good assets in a first world country with a first world income, then you can offset the problem that we've got in terms of the decline of our Global Wealth Index. And that is why we're so passionate about what we do and how we actually do it. Now, a lot of people say, well, what is your history? You know, how, how did you get into international property? Well, at the age of 22, I bought my first house internationally. I was living in London, and I bought a house back in Cape Town. It was a five-bedroom house in Rondebosch, and we had R4 planning. So what we did is we put tenants in while we got all the plans and drawings and everything through. And then we demolished the house, and we actually built six townhouses. So you can see the six townhouses here that we built in, in, uh, in Rondebosch. Now, this was actually my first experience with, with international investing. And I didn't know anything about having the right partners or getting the right management agents. I tried to do everything myself because, you know, you think that you, you're cleverer than anyone else. And I asked my brother to, to be my uh, management agent. And he was a student. So he was happy to receive a beer, a case of beer every month to, to sort it out. Until the guys stopped paying one month. And then I got hold of my brother and I said, please go sort it out. You know, I'm in London. There's nothing I can do. And he said, but I'm a doctor, not a debt collector. And um, I, I learned very early on that, that your partners and particularly your management partners are absolutely vital to the process. Then at the age of 24, I bought my first house in London. It was actually this house over here. And this is actually on a beautiful park. It's about a five-minute walk from Wimbledon Station. And really, you know, a lot of people in, in England want to buy period houses. They're about another fifty or $60,000. They don't get the same yield. And what, what uh, most tenants, particularly the, the professional sharers want, is a DSTV, a power shower, a, a, a nice interior. They don't want to be students anymore. They're much more, more worried about the interior of the property than the exterior. And this property did phenomenally well. What we actually did is we put a conservatory onto it. By doing that, we changed it from a three-bedroom into a five-bedroom, which for those of you who know in London, every single bedroom you've got adds an extra income stream. So a lot of my friends were, were telling me, yeah, but we just had September 11th. England's going to war with Afghanistan. Oil prices are going to go up. Interest rates are going to go up, and you're going to be in trouble. And I said, yeah, but guys, I'm buying a house. I'm adding two extra bedrooms. It's costing me 20,000 pounds. I remortgaged the property, took the money out, and actually went and invested in a second property with, uh, with my best friend, Warren. And um, what this allowed us to do, we, were, we, were, we had a passive income of more than 1,000 pounds per month, which we believed was – was you know a huge margin of safety in terms of where we were. And it's really a principle that I learned back in 2002, that people can have analysis paralysis. They can get caught up in the macro issues. I had a, a long debate with a good friend of mine this morning about quantitative easing and the impact it's going to have. But you know, back in 2002, those were the same debates I was having with people. And actually, it just comes down to the nuts of the bolts. Are the fundamentals right? And more importantly, is the asset that you're buying right? Do the numbers work? Do you have the right partners in terms of where you are? Another, another example, I built this house in 2004 in Atlantic Beach. It was a four-bedroom home. It was one of our dream homes. And one of the reasons that, uh, you know, that I bought it, built it, was that I wanted to return to South Africa and live in it. The problem was is that because I was long distance, I, this, is, this is when I realized how important it is to have your partners on the ground. Because at the end of the day, I come from a construction background. I study construction management. I am a property developer. And I work for an Irish property developer on site for over five years in London. And yet... Building this house back home, because I wasn't there, and even though I had a project manager, the project was 50% over budget and about eight months late. And the problem was, is that in 2007, I actually ended up having to sell the house because the quality was so terrible. And it's a real tragedy, 
But that is when I learned the value of having partners on the ground and the importance of having the best of breed partners. And I vowed there and then never again to actually do international investment where I don't have partners that I can work with who are on the ground that can, you know, kick the kick the kick the door and make sure stuff's happening. Because when you're long distance, it's impossible. I really, you know, from my experience, I don't care what people say. It really is impossible to do it long distance. Now, a question for, for those of you is that, um, you know, some people think, well, you know, that's where we started in the residential. But we're now playing in some pretty sophisticated market. We've done a lot of commercial in, in, uh, in Australia. And this is actually a commercial office park that we're building in, in America right now. It's a $16 million investment. It's got a cash net yield of 15%. We're financing it at a 50% loan to value, and it's got an IRR of 23%. So you can see that we've certainly been through the learning curves in terms of the residential, the, the development, right through to the commercial in terms of where we actually are. And I wanted to ask people in terms of people who are online tonight, could you quickly just uh, give me some sort of indication as to where you stand in terms of your knowledge of IPS? You know, is this your first webinar? Have you been following us before? Have you been following us for six months, 12 months, or 24 months? I'm just interested in terms of people's feedback so that I know how much you know about us in terms of where we are. But the feedback I actually had at the Wealth Masterclass is that um, I take it for granted that, you know, in terms of our experience, and, and people actually asked us to explain it a bit more. So please go ahead and, and let me know in terms of actually voting. I can see that we've got about 55% of people have voted. So I'll give you another five or 10 seconds, and we can actually see where you're at. <laughs> Clive's come and said that he's been following me for eight years. I, Clive and I, I remember very well. Clive was in our very first office in London back in uh, 2004, 2005. Uh, we've been uh, we've been working together for a long time. So I'm going to close that poll and uh, let me share the results quickly. It's it's quite interesting. 21%. This is your first webinar. 18% have been following us for six months. 39% for 12 months and 21% for 24 months. So. That's, uh, that's excellent. It, it really gives me some, uh, some good feedback in terms of where we actually are. So just for those of you who haven't seen us before, we've helped over 2,000 people invest internationally in international property to a value of over $1.7 billion. We only do international investments. We've got offices in South Africa, Australia, the UK, and America, which we pride ourselves on our global platform. We spend millions on research. To date, we've actually spent 2.7 million rand on America in terms of direct costs, in terms of flights there, the research we've paid for, the accommodation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's direct costs in terms of money we've actually spent in terms of research. And we've gone there every three months for since April last year. We pride ourselves on working with our best of breed partners. I truly believe that after 10 years and making, you know, having a lot of successes, but also having failures, we've learned what not to do and who not to work with. And that's helped us be able to find the best of breed partners as quickly as possible. We've got a sophisticated IT platform which provides efficiency and transparency, not only internally, but also for our clients in terms of where we are. And then one of the things that I think differentiates us is our private banking service. You know, most people think that just buying a property is the most important thing, you know, but we actually believe that that's only about 20%. Actually managing and maintaining the property, the tax, the structuring, the compliance is about 80%. And just yesterday, I spent three hours with, with Ian Scott, who's the managing partner of Grant Thornton, making sure we were up to date with all the tax, the structuring, and the compliance. And really, our after-sales department provides the best private banking service for international property in this country. It really is the investic of, of private banking in terms of the service. And, and we really, really work hard to differentiate ourselves and to provide that service that our sophisticated clients are used to. We've got access to off-market opportunities. You know, a lot of people talk about the inner circle. A lot of you would have heard Ryan talk about it. Just interesting enough, John Chin just got back two days ago from, from a new area up in North Dakota. We've got access to eight properties there that literally we will, the people that come on the buyer's trip will be the first people to get access to those properties with net yields of over 15%. And interestingly enough, those people that come on the buyer's trip will be the first ones to get it. Not the Americans, not the international market. But our clients and how do we do that it's because we believe in the principle of zig ziglar you can have anything you want in life if you help enough other people get what they want so we're investors but by helping other investors it helps our collective buying power which allows us to deal with the best in terms of actually getting access to the off-market opportunities 
that you don't find on the web and that you need the right partners. RJ was at the auctions just yesterday securing more properties for us in Atlanta. And again, properties that, that people just don't have access to. And then really interesting, if, if you are, I don't think it counts for a hell of a lot, but uh, I've got all the qualifications of people are interested. I've got two degrees, an honors degree and a master's degree, and also CRS would stand for Certified Residential Specialist. And we were also the first country to literally be invited as a member of the ARPP, which stands for the Association of International Property Professionals. It's the governing body run out of London that actually regulates all international property investments. And we won an award in 2008 for the most professional company operating out of Africa in terms of helping people invest internationally and something that we're very proud of to, to be part of. But I believe that what's much more important is actually our results in terms of where we actually are. You know, it's one thing to, to talk about accolades, et cetera, et cetera, but that really doesn't mean a hell of a lot. What is much more important is, uh, oops, sorry, uh, what just happened there? What's much more important is what's been achieved. So in the last 17 months, now you must understand, we went to America. We've been investing internationally, as I said, since 1999. We went to America in 2010. We knew there was an opportunity. Wherever there's blood on the streets, there's opportunity. We spent five weeks traveling around. We met many different partners, but we decided that the market wasn't right. And most importantly, in the just, way. what's that? Oh, sorry. <laughs> we decided that uh, that uh, that was Brendan for everyone. <laughs> but uh, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, sorry, I didn't know I was on. <laughs> We, we basically decided that uh, the market wasn't right in 2010. And more importantly, we couldn't find partners that we could trust. We went back in 2012. Funny enough, Brendan chipped in just at the right time. I went with Brendan and we pulled our resources with Neil Peterson, the owner and, and uh, producer and editor of uh, the Real Estate Investor magazine, and went and met many different. We did eight cities in 11 days. But since then, we decided that there was a huge opportunity in America. And I'm going to explain a little bit why. But this is what we've achieved in, in 70 months. We bought 251 properties to a value of $25.7 million. We've had a capital growth. We've experienced capital growth of between 10 to 30%, depending on when we bought properties and also depending on which markets we bought in. We've experienced net yields of 8 to 15%, again, depending on different markets and different areas. We've had five buyer's trips. You know, a lot of people say, well, why the buyer's trip? And the reason being is that it came out of necessity. Brennan and I were flying over. We were buying properties for ourselves, And people started saying, well, can you buy a property for me? And so we were like, okay, cool, no problem. And then they started saying, well, can we come with you? And so we said, okay, fine, come with us. And so we put a buyer's trip together. We've now done five buyer's trips. But also people say to us, well, the last one we bought, they, you know, they say to us, well, we missed the boat. And we go, no, you haven't. On the last trip when we were there in July, we bought 171 properties with an IRR of over 20%. So anyone that thinks they've missed the boat doesn't fully understand the opportunity, doesn't fully understand what it is that we're doing on the ground there. Now, people say to us, well, what are these buyer's trips and why do you do them? Well, the number one reason is that the reason that people fail in property is because they don't have the right information. So we say to people, if you don't like us, if you don't trust us, that's fine. Get on an airplane, come with us and get the right information. When you're on the ground, you can kick the dirt. You can, you can get the gut feel. You can meet the, the, the people in the street. You can read the newspapers. The bottom line is you can get the right information. And tell me, I can tell you one thing. What you read on the internet is not necessarily gospel. You need to get on the ground in terms of what is happening. The second thing is the partners. You know, we pride ourselves, as I've already said, in our partners. But there's nothing better than coming over, shaking the hand, looking in the eye, meeting the operation, meeting their team, seeing their sophistication, seeing whether they're good or bad in your opinion, talking to the other investors on the trip and, and understanding whether they believe they're good or bad. The most important thing that prides me is when people come over on the buyer's trip, we've got complete transparency. We introduce you to all our partners from the people that find the property to the people that renovate the property, the management, the maintenance, the accountants, the lawyers, the inspection agents, every single person in the process you get to meet. And that transparency is, I believe, what differentiates us completely because we've got nothing to hide. As I said, we're investors, we're investing. If you want to come and meet our partners, you're welcome to join us. A lot of investors say to me, you know, they fly all the way to London, they fly to Sydney, they fly to Atlanta, and then they can't find something and it frustrates them. What we do is we, we've got a very um, well-documented approach. 
where we understand exactly what it is you're looking for before you go over. We prep our partners so that when they're there and when our clients are there, they get action. They take advantage of looking at properties that are available. They have all the numbers. They can get inside. You know, these things are taken for granted. Brendan and I went on a buyer's trip. We couldn't get inside the properties and we had none of the numbers. It's impossible to make educated, informed decisions. We do that so that people can take action. Then we also have fun. You know, I don't believe that it's possible to work hard without having fun. America is an awesome place. There's plenty of tourist opportunities. You can't go to New York without having a great time. You can't go to, to, to Memphis without experiencing Elvis. You can't go to Atlanta and many of the other places we go to without having a great time. And so we, we tend to, I believe, in terms of people coming over, they, they have a little, little bit more fun than they were actually expecting to have. And then something that's a real treat on our next trip, and for some of them that were on the last trip, they, they got to experience this, is that a lot of people say, well, if I come on a buyer's trip, you know, on a, you know it's gonna, I don't want to sit on a bus with other people, and you know, I'm, I'm much more too important for that, et cetera, et cetera. But that's the completely wrong attitude. Because I've learned from these buyer's trips, the caliber of people on the trip and the sophistication of people on the trip is amazing. And not only, no matter where you are on that sophistication level, you get to learn from them. I mean, on our next trip, there's a guy, our business partner, Henny Besaid Note is coming. I mean, he literally took a business in Australia where we were investing in, in residential and commercial property from $4 million to $40 million in four years, listed the company, and it's now worth $200 million. And I'm talking Aussie dollars, not Rand. And all that we've done is take the exact same business model and cut, copy, and paste and invest in America with the same model. And the reason being is because it works. It's safe. It's de-risked. It's got the experience behind it. And, I mean, when you go to areas and you hear the questions being asked, it's amazing. You learn so much from people like that. And if you're at the same level, fantastic, because you get to ask the same questions. You get to bounce off each other in terms of what is happening and whether it's the right decision. So the caliber of people that you hang around with will influence the quality of the decisions that you make and ultimately the quality of your results in the future. And then this time is a very unique experience. Henny's actually been invited to speak at, at Mega 8 Partnering, which is 800 of the top businessmen in America are getting together. They're actually sharing tips and techniques on how they do stuff. He's been invited to talk about investing in Africa and globally and how he's had such success. And because of that, we've actually been given 10 VIP tickets. So myself and Brendan, and uh, John Chin and a couple of our top VIP clients will actually be joining us and spending the weekend and with some of the best in America, including Jack Walsh, the CEO of, of General Electric. So if you are interested in, in any of what I've said, just put buyer's trip in and I can send you more information. Really, we believe it's one of the most important things in terms of what we do. But if you don't have the time, you know, a huge amount of our clients, about 70% to be exact, are really, really busy. Their businesses are going really, really well, and they just do not have the time to come with us to America. And so what we suggest they do is they give us a mandate, and when we go over there, we your ears and eyes on the ground. We take videos, we take pictures, we send them back to you so that you can make educated, informed decisions, and then we help you actually invest. And I'm sure if you agree, if you look at 10 different properties, no matter how much we trust our partners, if you look at 10 different properties, two or three of them will always be that much better than the rest. And that's what the benefit is. So if you're interested in that, just, just type in mandate. If you're interested in the USA bias trip, just type, type in bias trip. And one of the guys can get back to you with, with all the details in terms of where it is. Now, from a bit of sophistication, a lot of people say to me, well, why do you just invest? You know, why America? Why not Australia? Why not London? And to be honest, we've invested extensively in London, extensively in Australia, extensively in South Africa, and extensively in America. But we've also got a very sophisticated system that we use as to where we invest and why we invest. It's a system that we built with Clem Sunter. It's a four-dimensional model. It takes all the fundamentals in terms of the four global scenarios that he works off, the three South African scenarios, which are the best asset classes, and then most importantly, the fundamentals of property and where one should be investing. And at the moment, taking into account the research, the numbers, so no emotion, purely fact and a and a very sophisticated system that's worked for a long time for us. There's only one country that is sitting in the high return, low risk at the moment, and that's America. Australia is sitting in the low return, low risk. The UK is bridging kind of low risk, high risk, and the rest are actually sitting in low return, high risk. Now, I'll go into that in a little bit detail of how we actually do it and, and why we actually do it. But the most important thing for us is that we only partner with the best. Clem Santa is literally in the top five scenario planners in the world. 
He's one of the most respected people in terms of his global technology for scenario planning. And we've taken his research, and in conjunction with him, we've actually written a book called Property Going Global. Some of you that have been to our events have actually seen our book. And a lot of what I talk about tonight, I don't have time to go into all the detail. And really, I am appreciative of people's time. But everything that we talk about is in the book. We did bring out a beta version. There's too many spelling mistakes for my liking. And so we're getting a final copy edited as we speak. It should be done by the early November. And if you want details on that, you can go to the website, propertygoingglobal.com, in terms of its actual release. But people say to me, you know, why America? And like I did with my London property, you can get into the macro. You can talk about the currency and quantitative easing and where the economy is going, what's going to happen with the world economy. Or you can just get simple. Keep it simple, stupid. We bought this house in October 2012. So nearly a year ago, we bought it for $85,000. So it's a beautiful, nice, big four-bedroom house in Atlanta. The price today is probably about $120,000. But what's really interesting for me is the replacement value. You know, it costs between $90 and $100 to build in Atlanta. This house is 2,000 square feet or roughly 200 square meters. So to rebuild this house without the land from scratch would be between $180,000 and $200,000 to rebuild. Now, I do not care what the prices were in 2007, but what I do care about is the intrinsic value. And a year ago, we were buying 60% below replacement value. Now we're probably buying 40% below replacement value, but it's still a way off the replacement value. And that for me is intrinsic value. But what's even more important to me is that when I consider in London, as an example, I'm buying property that is the most overvalued it's ever been. London prices for the last four months, are the highest they've ever been. The yields are between, the net yields are between 2 to 3%. In Atlanta, my net yields, or in America, my net yields are from 8 to 13%. So why would I even consider investing in London when I'm buying something at an intrinsic discount of 40% with triple the yield? It's common sense, ladies and gentlemen. And now, even better, on our last buyer's trip, we came across someone that can get us financing in terms of 50%. So we're getting better and better in terms of the quality of the partners we're dealing with and the quality of the transactions. Now, you can go to macro level. And for those of you that, that, uh, that are interested, I would highly recommend either reading the book or going on the website. The Economist does research every year around the end of August where they take the top 20 markets around the world and they basically analyze them. And they have done that for the last 20 years. And interestingly enough, they base all their valuations, whether it's residential or commercial, on income, which is the way it should be done. It shouldn't be, you know, based on sentiment. It's purely based on income. That's how you value property. And interestingly enough, America, at the end of August this year, they rate based on income as minus 12% below value in terms of affordability and income. They rate that the uh, Australia is 24% overvalued, and they rate that Britain or England is 14% overvalued. So that's the macro. But if you really want to get into the global property system, it's all about four fundamentals. The first one is the economic risk. Now, this is based on Clem Sunter's research, and it gives you the economic risk for each country based on the global scenario and the local scenario. The second fundamental is the value of the property discount. If you're buying, I've already mentioned, if you're buying something at a 50% discount versus full value, there's a lot less risk than if you're buying it at full value. And so these discounts are taken off the, off the economist report based on the long-term trends. The third one is the property fundamentals. Dolph DeRuis talks a lot about population growth. If you've got a country like Japan, where the population is going from 120 to 100 million, you've got a problem. And that's why property has gone sideways for over 20 years now in Japan. But also in Europe or England, you have an aging population. In fact, Clem Sanders says if you put a, a roof over an English village, you're going to have an old age home. And so what's very, very interesting is the population growth. And we take this off the IMF in terms of the International Monetary Fund. They release research every year in terms of the population growth. Then you've got supply and demand. And this is one of the most important fundamentals because if you take Cyprus or Italy or Ireland or Spain or Portugal, or even America for that matter, when we had the global financial crisis, the supply and demand was out of kilter. And because of that, the markets crashed and they stayed crashed for a long time. 
London, as an example, where supply and demand was in kilter, it, it dropped by 15%, but it recovered by 17% in 12 months. The Australian market really was not that badly affected. The South African market really was not that badly affected. The reason being is because supply and demand was in equilibrium. If anything, demand was outstripping supply. And interesting enough, in, in a place like America, because for five years there's been no supply, that absorption has taken place now. And actually, it's changed from a seller's market, sorry, from a buyer's market into a seller's market. And so these dynamics are changing all the time. And that's why these numbers have to be adapted all the time so that the global property system shows you the best results. And the last one, and the one that most people don't take into account, which is very, very important, is rule of law. You know, in South Africa, if I've got a tenant and I, and I want to get rid of them, they're not paying the rent, it's virtually impossible. If they tell me that they're pregnant, I don't know if you know this, but the tenant, it takes more than nine months to get them out. But you're not allowed to do anything while they're pregnant. And so the rule of law does not protect the property owner. In a first world country like Australia or America, the rule of law protects the property owner. And if the tenant doesn't pay in some of the states that we deal in America, they'll kicked out in three to six weeks. I'm going to repeat that. Three to six weeks. And that is by the law. It's actually by a sheriff. It's a put out crew. So one needs to be careful of this because you can take a place like India where all the fundamentals are right. Everything is right. They've got population growth. The supply and demand is in kilter. The economy is growing. There's even decent discounts on the properties, but there's no rule of law. You can't put a tenant in. There's no laws to protect it. So that is a factor that's taken into account. And that ultimately determines our risk value discount. And then on the other side, it's our return. And this is calculated with a 70% weighting on income and only a 30% weighting on capital growth. Because I've learned from the global financial crisis, those people that focus on income not only survive in hard times, but thrive. And those people that focus on capital growth die. And the reason that they die is it's like betting against winter. It will come, and therefore you've got to balance your portfolio. So for me, these are the fundamentals of property. This is why we, and this system is based on some extensive research, extensive systems, and it allows us to make the right educated and informed decisions as to where to invest. But you must understand these numbers are changing all the time. A year ago, the economist said that the American property market was 19% undervalued. So it's currently at 12% undervalued. So it's not going to be like this forever. You know, at the end of the day, you need to change. The dynamics change and you've got to take opportunity when it actually surfaces. So I, can, uh, I want to run through an FAQ in terms of some of the questions. And um, someone's asked a question here. Okay, so Teresa actually asked the question, do you think the government shutdown in the USA will have a serious effect on housing and tenants? Um, so if you could explain that a little bit, Teresa, in terms of what do you mean by government shutdown, do you mean the quantitative easing and the, the, the government going bankrupt, or what, what do you mean exactly in terms of that? Scott, I can answer that question if, you, uh, if you'd like me to jump in. Fire away, Brendan, please. Okay, so um, on the on the 30th of September now, uh, which was basically the end of the U.S. government's fiscal year, um, the the Republicans and the Democrats, Democrats, should I say, came to a bit of a um, you know a, a stall where they couldn't agree on um, on one particular aspect of Obamacare that needed to be uh, you know processed, and uh, what it pretty much meant was that they missed their deadline. Of 12 o'clock on 1st of October, um, and I think you were in presentations yesterday with Henny, um, so I don't know if you got my update on that stuff. I was chatting with John Chin about it, um, but basically, uh, because they hit that deadlock and they missed the deadline, a whole bunch of the um, USA government uh, services are being shut down, and they're calling it uh, in the media the government shutdown. Um, so you'll find like uh, zoos are closed today. And some federal nature reserves are closed today. Um, and effectively, what's going to happen with the housing market is not too much. They did have a, um, a government shutdown in 1995-96, and it affected them uh, not that badly. At the end of the day, they will work out the differences, and they'll, you know, and they'll get the budget back back on track. So what actually happened was the budget wasn't approved, and as a result, the government's only got about $30 billion access um, for them to be able to spend right now, uh, so they have to cut back massively um, before they get the new budget uh, approved. And as soon as the new budget is approved, then um, they'll you know be able to start up again. 
So you'll find some uh, some people are going to be not at work over the next week or two while they sort this out. Um, in terms of how is it going to affect the the property market, really not that much. Um, the only thing that's really going to be affected is uh, like private buyers that are going through Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, which are government um, mortgage uh, or at least mortgage insurers more than uh, mortgage givers. Uh, they're going to be on skeleton staff over the next week or two until all of this stuff is sorted out. So they're just not going to be processing as many loans as they would normally, um, which means that some people's closing times on properties they've already bought um, will be extended and it, it means that in terms of the, you know, the global economy or at least the USA economy is just going to show a few numbers that are going to be out of kilter over the next two or three months. So it's not really going to affect us that much unless they can't come to a solution and they end up having to put tax cuts in place uh, and that type of stuff. But um, at the moment they're, they're at loggerheads but they have to come to a so solution because there's no other way. But I would also I would add to that, Brendan. From my experience, every time I've made real money in property is when there's been chaos. And the more oh, yeah. chaos there is, it's actually music to my ears. Because the market has recovered so quickly in America. And actually, I quite like a lot of blood on the streets. I like pain. Because at the end of the day, you've got a, a sophisticated population that's not going anywhere. They still need to rent. And so what is great for us, for people that focus on income, is that you're still going to have tenants. I guarantee it. I don't, you know, and so what it actually does is it provides you with a great asset class to, to, to basically hedge against problems. And so with regards to the American shutdown, firstly, I think that's probably overdramatic, but let, let's say it's not. Let's say it falls, falls apart completely. And, um, and Michael asked a very good question, which I'm going to answer as well. If it does, that's great news. Because what will happen is that sentiment in America will change. The funds will come out of the property market, which, uh, which they did five years ago. And um, ultimately, you know, this, when sentiment changes, that's when we'll be able to, it will go back to being a, a buyer's market, which is fantastic because there's certainly ample yeah. supply for tenants and income, both in residential and specific. You've got to be very careful in commercial, but certain, certain sectors of commercial. And we'll benefit. And it just means that we will actually benefit more. So I, I hope that they remain well, longer. The, the articles I actually read today on that um, was, was quite a, a cool guy. Um, I'll see if I can find the article later for you. But uh, he basically said that um, it will delay some of the, the housing growth that we're going to get um, very, very slightly. But uh, ultimately, it's going to create some pent up demand. And the growth is going to then be exponential in a couple of you know, months' time as a result of that. Um, so he was very bullish on the on the property market as a result of this whole government shutdown thing. But uh, basically, it's not really going to affect it that much. Three things I would say about this. Firstly, before I answer Michael's question, if you come on a buyer's trip, then you won't sit on the internet having uh, ifs and buts. You'll actually come with us. You'll come to New York. You'll meet our friends that we've got on Wall Street. You'll meet the bankers, the lawyers, the everyone else, and you'll be able to make an educated, informed decision. Because I can promise you, having invested in international property since, the, since 1999. If you think that you can sit wherever you are at your computer and make educated, informed decisions about what's happening in a market with the size of America based on a couple of news reports, then unfortunately you're vastly wrong. So that is the whole reason for doing the bias trips because you get the right information, you come over. The second thing I would say is Michael said, what's your view on the possibility of the USD collapse? Interestingly enough, Michael, when I first went to America, uh, sorry, not first went to America, but when I went in April last year with, with Brendan, Brendan actually said to me, Scott, you're such a negative person. And I said, no, I'm not. But having done this for a long time and having up to over 2,000 people invest internationally, I would much rather go in with negative glasses and try and understand what the problems are than go in with rosy tinted glasses just looking for the opportunity. And one of the three major opportunities we, or sorry, one of the three major risks that we looked at, and, and it's in the book if you, if you want to read about it, it's actually in our American report as well if you want to read about it there, is what is the possibility of the of the Aussie of the not the sorry of the USD becoming not necessarily the number one currency in the world as well? And we met with Wall Street bankers. Or a good friend of mine from UCT is actually one of the guys that's really high up in UBS, which is one of the top private banks around the world. And he said categorically that uh, if you look at it, the the Chinese don't want the UN to be the the trading currency. The world won't allow it to happen because they're too regulated and. More importantly, the Chinese won't let it happen because it means that their currency will increase in value by 30% and 
which will wipe out the industry. And they already got a, a challenge with that. The last thing I would say is that even if it was to happen, who here knows what happened to properties in Zimbabwe through the entire crash in Zimbabwe? I'm not sure, Brendan, if you're aware of this or if anyone else can answer. But I want to know, I'm sure that everyone will agree that what happened in Zimbabwe is as bad as it can get. Hyperinflation, currency completely collapsing, economic and government completely collapsing. What do you think actually happened to Zim property? And I'm not talking about farms. I'm talking about investment properties. Interesting. So the first person who's typed it in got it 100% right. He said properties hold their value in global terms. Bricks and mortar increased. They appreciated. Value stayed put. Stayed the same price and increase in USD. Perfect. You guys are excellent. You've obviously been uh, listening and learning from a lot of different uh, people. That's exactly what happened. In 2001, my uncle lived in Harare. Most of you know my story. And when it collapsed, I said, well, there's blood on the streets. Let me get to Harare. There must be great opportunity. He said, you're mad. He said, everyone's investing in property right now. It's the only thing that's holding its value. And more importantly, it's the only thing that's holding its value in US dollar terms. If the US dollar was to collapse, there would be some other intrinsic currency. Maybe it is the yuan. And the bottom line is, People still need properties. Businesses still need places to operate from. More importantly, from a residential perspective, people need places to live. They hold their value. And I think Zim is one of the biggest learning examples for me of that. I was in Zim literally in March. And in Harare, there were houses there, old crappy houses that were built, you know, looked like 1980 houses in South Africa. They were worth 400,000 US dollars. And there's no financing. So people pay cash for that. And it makes no sense to me when I can buy a nice house in Atlanta for $100,000, dollars But I come back to, to, to answering, and I don't want to get weighed down on this in terms of Michael's question, but there are risks. And one needs to understand these risks. And that's why we go over every three months to make sure we got our finger on the pulse. But equally so, it's what is the downside? How do I manage the downside? And you can be like a lot of my friends were in 2002 when we just had September the 11th that told me that the world was going to fall apart. And they sat on the fence for five years. And then in 2007, they finally decided the world wasn't going to get it, fall apart. And so they bought properties in London in 2007, 2008. And then the market did crash. And the point is, they bought the wrong properties because they bought upmarket apartments that looked nice, that would keep their girlfriend happy. They didn't buy three-bedroom houses that they could convert into five-bedroom houses where they were you know, very sure of an income stream. And that allowed us to be able to get through. So when there are tough times, Income is what gets you through in terms of where you actually are. Paula Martin said, Germany has come up on both this year and last year's stats as being undervalued. Why not invest in German property? Any research done there yet? Paula, a great question. A huge amount of research has been done there. Myself and Henny actually looked at investing in commercial property there for about two years. There's two reasons, sorry, there's three reasons why we don't invest in the German, uh, in Germany. The first reason is that even though the German economy is extremely strong, it's tied to Europe. It's a bit like a South African taxpayer. It doesn't matter how wealthy a South African taxpayer is. We've only got 3 million taxpayers paying for 45 million other people or 15 million people on grants. And unfortunately, Germany is tied to Europe. And therefore, no matter how well they do, they're still keeping the rest of Europe afloat. The second reason is, is that they've got a fundamental pro problem with the population. It's an aging population, and that is going to impact them, not just them, but the whole of Europe. And so long term, there's a structural problem there. And thirdly, it's a socialist based country. I don't know if you know this, but 65% of Americans actually own their property. In South Africa, it's actually quite a good number as well. In, in uh, Germany, only 22% of people own property. 22%. And so the problem is, is that it's very socialist. All the laws are in favor of the tenant. You can't put up, they've got rent controls and, and a whole bunch of other things. And for me, I don't like playing in those, in those regulated markets. And then one that, uh, that's, that is always an issue for me is that they speak German. And so when I read a contract, I don't know what I'm doing. And it makes it a hell of a lot more difficult. And any of you that have tried to invest in, in markets where they don't speak English, if, you, if you're not, well, if you can speak German, that's fantastic. But if I, I can't speak German, therefore, why take the extra risk in a market where I don't understand the language when I can invest in a country where they speak English? So that's, uh, that's the answer. But uh, great question, Paula. Uh, Brendan and I and, and all our IPS uh, colleagues, we're all international investors and we love looking at all this stuff. And that's why the global property system is so important because there's no one factor that, that you can just take into account. There's four major fundamentals, just like four tables of four legs of a table. 
And if one's not good, the whole table you know, falls over. And that's why it's so important. But great question. I got asked the same question last night at a live event. And I love asking. I should actually just answer that question about Germany. Um, one of the FAQs we get all the time is uh, how do you choose the right partners? And I think really the best way to describe this is with experience. Having done this, as we said, for so long, we've learned what works. We've also learned what doesn't work. You know, And unfortunately, 80% of people who invest offshore actually lose money. There was research that came out in 2010, South Africans. Um, now, that's not just property. That's also stocks and shares. There's two major reasons for that. The first one is they make emotional decisions. The RAND devalues, they get on an airplane, they basically fly to London or Sydney or Atlanta, and they say, I'm going to buy a property in three days because you know, I'm really sophisticated. I know exactly what I'm doing in South Africa, and I'm going to do the same thing overseas. It doesn't work. It does not work. I've never seen it work successfully. It's impossible, having done this for, since 1999. The second thing is, is that they get the wrong information and they have the wrong partners. They go over, they told the estate agent or the, the agent they're dealing with tells them exactly what they want to hear. And they're basically just in it for a short term and, uh, and, they, and they find themselves in trouble. The way we choose our partners is with our experience. We know what we're looking for in terms of people that have got longevity, people that care about the client, people that like to work on referral business. Our partners are our most important asset. And that's why we pride ourselves on taking people over on our bias trips to introduce them to our partners. But don't get me wrong, we've also made mistakes. And um, so, you know, as an example, we had a problem in Orlando with one of the management agents. They weren't communicating properly. And so we went to America and we fired them. And we moved all our clients over to a new management agent. We've also changed our model, um, which we've got in, in Australia and in America now, where we only like to work with people where everything's under one roof. So the person that is, is finding and, and renovating the property is also doing the management and maintenance because you don't want the left hand telling you one price and the right hand delivering another price. When it's all under one roof, they're accountable to each other. Ken Barker says, is Ireland an interesting place to invest? It seems the residential properties there are both undervalued as far as potential rental income goes, as well as having declined significantly from their price levels five years ago, which would indicate an upside potential. Ken, it's a great question. I'm going to answer it very quickly. And if you want to hang around afterwards, I can answer it more. I've been to Ireland 10 times. I've actually got an Irish passport. I think they're the greatest country on the planet after South Africa. I think they're the most common people like South Africans. They like to play rugby. They love sport. They love to um, work hard and they also like to have fun. But saying that, the Irish economy is in serious trouble. It's also an aging population. It doesn't have a, a GDP that's based on any sort of significance. They try to bring uh, the IT industries in. And the biggest problem is what caused their bubble was very low, uh, very low uh, debt. So they used to borrow between 10, 11, 12 percent, similar to South Africa. And then suddenly they joined the euro. And based on the power of the German banks, they basically dropped their interest rates to 2 or 3 percent. Now, the question I would ask you is what would happen in South Africa if interest rates dropped to 2 or 3 percent? The place would explode. Well, that's what happened. The Irish remortgaged everything. They went and bought property all over the world. The challenge in Ireland, and I'm not sure if you're aware of this, according to research from the BBC, one in every four houses in Ireland sits empty at the moment. So don't get me wrong, Ken. There might be good discounts, but it's not a fundamental market I'd like to be in because the, the, the fundamentals of supply and demand are not right. I'm going to battle to get capital growth, and it's going to be very difficult to find a good tenant, therefore an income stream, and therefore for me it won't be sustainable. So. I mean, look, we, we could talk all night about almost every country. The greatest thing for us and that we pride ourselves on is, is having the experience. Whether we've invested there or not, I actually tried to buy uh, and build eight houses down in Southern Ireland in Cork in uh, 2003. But that's another story. In terms of the partners, we, as I said, we like to only work and deal with the best. This is actually George Ross. George Ross is the attorney. He's the number one confidant of, jo of um, Donald Trump. He's actually his, his number one advisor. We got to play golf with him for a day. I actually shared a golf cart with him. Absolutely awesome learning from one of the greatest minds who's been around in property there. I mean, he's 84 years old. He knows more about the American property market than anyone I've ever met before. So we really tapped into his knowledge, where the good markets were, where, the, where, you know, where not to, where to avoid. And it was really reassuring that, that he actually told us that the markets we were investing in were some of the best markets in America. J.D. Fox is the number one world and wealth coach uh, and wealth and property coach. Sorry. He's actually my personal business coach. He's doing quite a lot in terms of with our team in terms of where we are. And we're working with a number of his partners. We're working with his accountant, his lawyer, 
We've met some very strategically good partners through him. So it's all about working with the best. Uh, Warren Buffett has a philosophy when he invests that he that he pays people to tell him why not to invest. You know, every opportunity, whether it's business or property, will have risk. And you need to understand what that risk is. You need to be able to manage that risk. And then ultimately, you can make the right decisions as to whether to invest. And in, two, in uh, August last year, Henny came over and he met all our different partners. And he said to me, he said, Scott, that John Chin guy, he's the guy that can do our Warren Buffett analysis like we had in Australia. And that's how we were able to have those successes that we had in Australia. And so after that, you know, Brendan and myself and, and Henny, you know, worked with John and, and, and really, you know, really liked the guy. And we finally got him on board. He, he used to work with about 20 different companies. He then broke it down to only working with four internationally, of which IPS was one of them, which was, you know, really, really an accolade to our team and to our clients, to be fair. And then, um, and then about three months ago, we actually got him exclusively to, to work on our behalf for the deals in terms of where we are and, and what it is we're doing. And interestingly enough, one of uh, the most astute property people in this country I had, I had dinner with about a week or two ago, and he was with John, actually, and he met John two and a half years ago, and he said that John was the number one guy that he had met in America. So it was really great to know that we've got the best team. And we work with Grant Thornton in terms of our tax, our compliance, and our structuring. As I said to you yesterday, I had a three-hour meeting with, uh, with Ian Scott, who's the managing partner. We've got opinions. We've spent now about 240,000 rand in terms of making sure that everything is set up and, and is right. And quite interesting, you know, we're not allowed to share that with everyone publicly, but for our clients, we share that advice. Because again, we're investors and we need it for ourselves, but we're very happy to share it with our current clients. And then we've got, you know, one of the best legal teams. We've also got a finance team that is helping us get some of the best finance deals in America. We've got private finance in terms of ways to actually get access to finance. And then we've also got someone that's teaching us and teaching our clients how to get a credit rating within six months so that they can get traditional bank financing at four and a half percent fixed. Sorry, it's four and a half percent fixed for 20 years at an 80 percent loan to value. Now, for me, that's an absolute no brainer if one's you know buying properties at an eight to 13 percent net yield. And if you are interested in, in any of the stuff, just put in asset manager and they'll be able to get back to you and tell you the details in terms of where they are. David DeVent has asked, will IPS help with an exit strategy, i.e. the sale of U.S. property? Look, at the end of the day, David, we're all investors. We all understand we want an exit strategy. That's why our partners are so important. So, yes, certainly we will help. Um, not, maybe not necessarily ourselves directly, but certainly our partners will work with our partners because the exit strategy, you want to sell locally to, to a local home buyer because that's how you'll get your greatest return in terms of where you actually are. But our partners have that whole solution in place to be able to deliver that. The second question we get all the time is how do you get the right information? And the only way to answer that is time and money. As I said, Brendan, Brendan's got a young child. I've got a young child. And he's 58 years old. And yet all of us, including Ryan and Yaku and Teresa and Raleen, have all flown over to the States. We spent a lot of time there. We've been there seven times in the last uh, 17 months. And that's how we've done it. We spent 2.7 million rand in direct costs. And we spent a lot of time, I'd probably say, Shit, if every trip's two and a half weeks, we've probably spent nearly three months there. And that's how we get the right information because we're on the ground. And then really with our experience in, in multiple international markets, we know how to ask the right questions. And you know, really, if you want to deal with a sophisticated person, it's the caliber of the questions that they ask that actually determines the caliber of their sophistication. How do you know what the right areas are to invest in? Well, a lot of people don't understand this, but in, in South Africa, if you've got Cape Town or Johannesburg, they're known as an MSA, which stands for Metropolitan Statistical Area. Do you know that in America, there are over 300 MSAs? And so interestingly enough, you know, where do you start? It's massive. The number one way to know if you're talking to someone and they don't know what they're talking about when it comes to American property is ask them, where do you think, what do you think is going to happen to the American market? And if they tell you it's going to go up or down, they're talking rubbish because there's no such thing as an American market. While one area is going up, another area is going down. It's one of the things that I found absolutely fascinating and love about the market. Between us, we've been to 17 different markets in America. We've literally been boots on the ground, met partners in all 17 of these different cities. So a lot of people will, you will talk about different areas, San Diego, Las Vegas, Phoenix, Charlotte, you know, um, Detroit. But the difference is we've been there. We just chose not to invest there. And the number one reason is because of the quality of our partners, then the fundamentals of the area, and then being able to provide a solution that can execute on the opportunity. So at the moment, we've been investing in Orlando, North Dakota, Atlanta, Memphis, and, uh, and Oklahoma. And again, tonight, I don't have 
the time to go into the, the fundamentals of why those areas and what the absorption rates are and what the fundamentals of those states are and what the tax structures are and why the, 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 the tenant-friendly, sorry, they, they're landlord-friendly states, not tenant-friendly states. But if you just put in asset manager, one of our asset managers can talk to you and understand what it is you're trying to achieve and then tell you which markets we invest in. I mean, as an example, Brendan and I spent 80,000 Rand each flying to go on a course last year. And that wasn't our flight. That was just purely to go on the course to Las Vegas and Phoenix to go and look at what we were told was the best property in America. And yet we couldn't find partners we could trust. So we didn't care how good the opportunity was. And I'm sure Brendan would agree with me. I wish we could find great opportunities in Vegas because it's great to go there. But, um, but, you know, if you don't have the good partners, you can't execute. So we've got reasons why we don't invest in all these markets and we've investigated them and we can share that with you. How do I know I'm getting the best deals? It's a great question. A lot of people are nervous. They look on the internet and they think that they're getting the right information. We had a great example recently where, where a lady actually purchased a property uh, from us, then went on the internet, found another one down the road at a cheaper price. And interestingly enough, um, she got hold of us. As I said, we're completely transparent. We got hold of our partner. He said, oh, no, that property, he actually has it uh, under offer. It's a short sale. Um, but and, and just to put in number, the price was $110,000 that she was buying a fully uh, refurbished house for. And she found one just down the road for about uh, 85 and she said, oh, I'm being you know, robbed and this is ridiculous and I don't know what's going on here and blah, blah, blah. And she pulled out the deal. Interestingly enough, that house just sold about a month ago for $135,000 on auction, pre-renovation. And the reason that, uh, that our partner pulled out of the deal was that it had liens over the, over the property. Now, a lien is a debt. The debt stays with the property. We couldn't get rid of the debt. Therefore, we didn't want to buy it. We always spend between fifteen and seventeen thousand dollars on average on a property in terms of refurbishment, and then uh, you know so so in terms of the numbers, they were actually really comparable in terms of where they were around the hundred, hundred and ten. And interesting enough, that property a month later sold for one hundred thirty-five thousand dollars, no renovation, and had liens or debt over the property, and that lady could have picked up that property for one hundred and ten thousand. So that is how you know you're getting the best deals. And if you come on the buyer's trip. You get to see the partners. You get to touch, kick, and feel so that you get a feel as to what's happening. Because if you trust what's happening on the internet, you're dead. It doesn't work. I mean, literally, Brendan and I went over with a million dollars in May just to check this out ourselves again. We had a million dollars in a bank account. We had an American bank account. We had an American cell phone. We put a whole lot of offers on the internet, and not one single agent got back to us. And we were going to arrive in Atlanta in a week, and we said we can close fast with cash. And interestingly enough, you know, no, we, literally no one come back to us. So what you see on the internet is rubbish. What you learn from the partners is what is the truth. And so far away, how do I manage the, 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 the property? And that's a great question, you know, but I do say that sophisticated investors understand that if they live in Cape Town and they've got a property in Cape Town, they don't try and manage it themselves. There's a ceiling of complexity. You get the right partners, you get the right management agents to look after your property. So for me, I own properties all over South Africa. I own properties internationally. I don't really care. I've lived in Joburg for a long time. I don't manage my properties in Joburg. I lived in Cape Town for a long time. I don't manage my properties in Cape Town. And so for me, it's about finding quality property managers. And, and it's very difficult. It's an oxymoron to, to find a good quality property manager. And apologies for anyone who's online. But finding a good quality property manager and finding someone who knows how to deal with international investors is virtually impossible. But that's what we specialize in. And so my logic is whether the properties in Johannesburg, London, Sydney, or Atlanta is irrelevant to me. It's the quality of the partners. And interestingly enough, a lot of the problems we have in South Africa, in fact, the reason I've stopped investing in South Africa is because the rule of law doesn't count here. But worse than that, people don't respect the law and do everything they can to try and break it and not pay their rent and, and take the system and go to the housing tribunal and all that rubbish. In first world countries like Australia and America, believe it or not, the rights of a property owner are protected. And I actually find that managing my international properties is a hell of a lot easier than managing my local properties because people actually respect the fact that they are, you know, how the, how the system works. How do I get finance? Again, there's not enough time to go into a huge amount of detail here, but we've got a private finance company. They're one of the best in America. They give you 50% loan to values. And the greatest thing is that they don't take into account your income back home. It doesn't matter what your credit rating is. It doesn't matter how much money you earn. They take into account the quality of the asset that you're buying 
and the income stream on that asset. They are more interested on the income stream of the asset and who the management person is than you yourself. So when they go to an area like, like this lady came to us in Atlanta and vetted our partners on the ground, they're more interested in the quality of the refurbishment and the quality of the management partner than they are in you or some stupid valuation on the internet. Because that is what is, determines the long-term success. And they're all about setting our partners up or our clients up for success. And interesting enough, they've been running over six years. They've done over a thousand mortgages. They haven't defaulted on one single person. And they've been in business right through the crash. So if you're interested, again, you know, put in asset manager. One of our asset managers can tell you how that works. We've helped a lot of our clients actually buy properties for free. And interesting enough, we're ramping up our existing clients' portfolios in terms of where they're going and how they're doing it. And the really exciting thing is we've also met someone now that can help us get a credit rating, as I said, in less than six months, which helps us get access to the traditional financing. The property management, maintenance, tax, structuring, and banking, this is all part of our private banking service. This is what most people don't offer, and this is why we are so adamant in terms of how important it is. We believe it's 80% of the transaction. Brendan is incredibly good at process flows. He's created a very sophisticated mind map. This is just a simple mind map. It's a very sophisticated system we use in MindJet to manage the entire process. There's four major parts of the process. And our asset managers, and more importantly, our private banking after sales solution, manages and holds your hand right through the transaction. We can't make sure that every problem goes away, but we certainly hold your hand and make it as smooth as possible. And just like with private banking, you deal with one person from beginning to end, and so they actually help you out. If it's so good in America, why, why are Americans not investing, and why are they coming out to South Africa? That's a great question. You get asked it all the time. There's three reasons why the Americans are not investing. Firstly, when you're in the middle of a firefight, it's very hard to have reality. Most Americans, their houses went from you know $100,000 to $40,000, to put in perspective, or a million dollars to $400,000. Their attitude towards property is really bad. They're not interested. They've you know, lost their life savings, et cetera, et cetera. Secondly, when that happened and their house got repossessed, they got a bad credit rating. So now for seven years, they can't get access to finance. And thirdly, the type of property that we're buying needs to be renovated. It needs between fifteen dollars to $17,000 worth of renovation, and they just don't have the capital. So they provide great tenants. But interestingly enough, the sophisticated investors, some of the biggest, most sophisticated investors in America, they are buying up properties. One company last year bought 29,000 single family homes in America. So don't get me wrong, the Americans are doing it. And our partners didn't come to South Africa. We went to America. Brendan, myself, Neil got on a plane, went to America to find them. They were too busy dealing with American investors and international investors. But we really pride ourselves on the fact that we built exclusive relationships with them. And we know we've got the best partners on the ground for our clients. And then the question is, there's lots of companies that offer offshore investment, and many of my friends have lost money. How do I choose the right company? Well, the best advice I could give you on that is get a report on the six things that, that uh, the six things you need to know on how to invest offshore. Whether you invest with us or not, doesn't bother me. But having done this over 2,000 times, we as a team have a huge amount of experience, and we put together a report so that we can help you ask the right questions, so that you know what to do, so that you can avoid the mistakes that other people make. Surely it's cheaper if I deal directly with Americans. How do you make your money? We're very transparent. We charge an upfront fee, which is effectively our private banking fee, which allows us to provide that private banking service from beginning to end. And then we work with our partners on the ground and we share the commission 50-50. The reason being, we need them, they need us. It's a very simple, easy deal. If you want to go to America and cut us out the deal, no problem. We'll, you know, they'll, the price will still be the price because the commission is the commission in terms of where it actually is. And then a question we get asked all the time, is uh, who else have you helped? You know, show me some of the results. And so I am conscious of the time and I'm going to breeze through this uh, quickly. But Gert bought a property, he's a farmer about two hours outside of uh, Johannesburg. He bought a property in Atlanta in August 2012 on our first buyer's trip. He didn't actually come. He gave uh, me a mandate and I bought him a property in Atlanta. I bought him this house on the right for $135,000. It was really up market house in a nice area. He's got a net rent of $1,033 per month, a 9.18% net yield. He's experienced between 25 to 30% growth. Now, we all understand that, you know, you can't work out capital growth exactly unless you sell. But when you do comparative market analysis in the area, he's experienced between 25 and 30% growth. The rand has devalued 23% since he bought the property. He's experienced a net income 
in the last 12 months of over $12,000. He bought another property in Orlando. It's actually a two bedroom, two bathroom. He bought it for $57,000 in August 2012. He's had a net rent of $3,800. He's had 17% growth in Orlando. And as I said, the round is devalued 23%. And because of the performance and what we've done, he's recently just invested another $100,000 in Wealth Migrate. We've got an exclusive golf course opportunity at the moment. We are buying up golf stands with planning permission on an existing golf course for $15,000 a stand. They've got all their services in place. That's 150,000 Rand, ladies and gentlemen. And to be honest, it, we, we, we opened it up for an afternoon to our current clients. It was snapped up by, by eight investors in, in, literally, um, in literally an afternoon. And it was all the people who've been current clients and people who've been on the buyer's trip. And that's the, that's the example. And the expected returns there are 27% in, in roughly six months. It's, it's really a, a, a short, great project in terms of what we're doing. Tristan, who's one of Brendan's clients. Brendan, I'm not sure if you're actually online there, but um, Tristan also gave Brendan a mandate. And uh, basically, he, he bought this two-bedroom, two-bathroom apartment here in Orlando for $69,000. The net income he's received for the last 12 months is about $6,000 or a 9.2% net return. He's experienced 12% capital growth. And as we said, the rand is devalued about 23%. I can see, Brendan, you've unmuted yourself there. Do you have anything to say about uh, Tristan there? Yeah, Tristan, he's, he's a fantastic guy. Um, and, and he bought a couple of places from us last year, which was quite awesome. And this particular one, I mean, there's a beautiful lake right next to the apartment over there. So it's overlooking the lake. It's fantastic. And I mean, uh, they're selling for quite substantially more than what he paid for them right now, about you know, 12% more. And then he also had the compounded benefit of the RAND evaluation. But what was quite funny is he had to do his tax returns at the end of the year now. Brennan, and, just, uh, oh, Brennan, obviously, just, before, yeah. sorry, Brennan, just before you do that, I just wanted to show people um, in terms of his Atlanta property. This is Atlanta property he bought uh, for $97,000. He's had a net income of 9.74%. He's had 18% growth, 18.5%. The RAND is devalued 23%. And then, sorry, you were just saying about, so he owned these two properties, one in Orlando, one in Atlanta, but he owned them both cash and he was receiving all the income. And, and what happened, Brennan? Yeah, basically, uh, he was receiving all that income and uh, he had to then go and pay some taxes at the end of this year on that income. It was a very small amount. I think he only paid about uh, $1,200 in taxes. But um, the, the bottom line is he, he came back to me and he said on one of the emails he saw that we can now do finance. He's like, well, get me another property. I want to finance it. And he ended up buying one in Oklahoma and another one in, in Atlanta um, purely so that he could offset the interest charges there because it would be it makes much more sense paying the bank from out of another property from the tenant's income uh, rather than having to pay the tax at the end of the year. So he effectively doubled his portfolio. Um, to avoid having to pay the IRS again, and he's now got two more income-producing assets in dollars, and one of them uh, he didn't even have to move a cent to actually get it. So it was quite fantastic for him. Yeah, and that's the example of how we like to build portfolios with people. It's not about helping people just invest in one-off properties. It's about building portfolios. Another client who came over on our October buying trip, um, it was actually Rolene Powell. She's an accountant. She bought this house behind here. Um, which was $95,000. The projected rent was $1,050 per month. They actually ended up getting $1,150. They've experienced a growth of about 36%, and the RAND is devalued by 14.9%. And interesting enough, Ian, you can see him standing outside the house here. He came over with us in February because he wasn't there in October. He hadn't seen what his wife bought. And he was so impressed by the quality of the property, the quality of the refurbishment, the quality of the tenant, that they ended up buying another two properties. They've subsequently... Um, actually immigrated from uh, South Africa. They moved to Australia. And it's quite interesting because they wanted to make sure that they kept up their wealth in terms of global wealth terms. And they believed there was a far better opportunity in America than Australia. But they believed that by owning these offshore assets, it gave them the freedom to be able to go and live in Australia. And so I'm not necessarily saying you want to live in Australia or leave South Africa, but it's great to be able to have the freedom like Ian and Raleen and be able to go and live there. Another client was Andrew and Damien to lean Damien Talin, actually, this is Damien, and she came over in October. They bought two properties, uh, $95,000. They've had a growth of about 30%. The RAND is devalued 14.9%. And interestingly enough, they it's quite funny. I call them secret shoppers. Brendan and I always laugh about them because they always tell us they're coming on a buyer's trip and then they're going to see their cousin. And then after a few nights and a couple of drinks, they finally tell us they're going to see our competitors. 
And I always say, guys, go and see our competitors. I'm very happy for you to go and see our competitors because we know that we've got the best partners on the ground. And interesting enough, Damien went on that trip and so did Michiel. And both of them came back, both of them invested through us because both of them said the quality of our partners, the quality of our refurbishments is just at another level. In fact, Michiel said one of our competitors is very good at Photoshop because he makes the properties look hell of a good on the internet, but they're bloody terrible when you actually see them in real life because they tend to go for lower quality areas, lower quality properties because the returns look better on paper. But, the, you know, I always say to people, there's a big difference between a paper yield and a real yield. Um, Damien and Andrew were so happy with their properties that he's actually resigned from his job and is now looking to come on our buyer's trip and, and do this on a full-time basis. And he's actually a financial advisor. Michael and Lee Honeyset, he, he came in February. He was uh, full of laughs. I, I was actually talking to him today. He bought four properties for $456,000. He's had a growth of 16% in six months, which is about $72,000. The rand is devalued 12%. Is that a net income per month of 3,325? You know, my question is who would like to have a passive income of over 30,000 Rand a month for doing nothing? Um, and you get to live in, in, uh, in South Africa. His total income, net income that he's earned is, is nearly $20,000. And so since February, in actual numbers terms, he's earned over a million Rand. And, um, you know, a lot of South Africans say to me, yeah, but I can do much better in South Africa. I do challenge them to show me where they can do about a 25% return in six months and these are actual numbers i mean that's the house that michael owns standing there's michael standing behind him he was so impressed with it he's, he's actually invested another four hundred thousand dollars in wealth migrate we currently have an opportunity in oak forest where we're buying properties for we're going to build them for about two hundred eighty thousand dollars we can sell them for over four hundred thousand dollars so there's very good margins there in terms of the return and he's also investing in our commercial office park that i showed you earlier where we've got uh, yields of about 15 percent and uh, he's actually looking, it's not all about the big stuff. He's also looking at buying another three houses. So his portfolio will be up to about seven in the, in the near future. I know he's bought two and he's getting another one. And then uh, lastly, Emmanuel and Kathy. A lot of people say that, you know, it's very difficult to do this long distance. Well, there's no better example than this. They're actually based in Malaysia and um, they found Brendan on the internet. Brendan communicated with them over the internet. They bought a property sight unseen. Again, they gave Brendan a mandate. He helped them buy in Memphis. They were very yield hungry. So all they wanted to do was go for yield. He looked at all the internet, uh, all the different websites, and finally went with, uh, with what Brendan recommended. And he bought this house. It's a three-bedroom, one-bathroom house in Memphis. Uh, it's what we call a type C. We've got different quality houses there, type C, type B, and type A. Again, our asset managers can explain that. They're getting a net yield of over 13%. And uh, subsequently, they came back with us on the last trip in July. And, and him and his wife were so impressed by the house and the area and everything else that they ended up buying two more properties. And um, they now want to be an affiliate and actually help people invest out of Kenya and Malaysia. So I don't know, Brendan, if there's anything I've forgotten there, but uh, they certainly, you know, really no, you, you pretty much covered it. Uh, and it speaks volumes that um, when people actually do come with us on the buyer strip and see everything firsthand, meet the people, um, you know, and they end up buying again and again. Uh, when there literally are lots and lots of opportunities in America, it's it's ultimately the people that you choose to deal with that determine whether your investment is a, a success or not. And uh, and I think that's where those smart savvy investors that are investing through us see the value of that um, when they're actually there on the ground. You know. Yeah. And again, if anyone's interested in the buyer strip, just type in buyer strip and we can give you more information. Puppy asked a question, said, what are the actual services that you offer? What's the benefit uh, for you? So I did try and answer that a little bit earlier, Puppy, but just to just to reiterate, because I think it's important for everyone, is that we basically are investors. And Zig Ziglar has a principle, and it's what we built the entire company on for the last 10 years. If you, help, you can have anything you want in life if you help enough other people get what they want. So Brendan, myself, Ryan, Yaku, Teresa, Raleen, we're all investors. And Kristen as well. And we're all investors. And because we're investors, by helping other people invest, we as a group have much better collective buying power. We get to work with the best partners on the ground. So what's in it for us? The number one thing that's in it for us is that we get to deal with the best partners and we get access to the best opportunities along with you. The second thing that's in it for us is that, as I explained in terms of the fee structure, we charge a, a private banking fee up front, which again, if you talk to one of the asset managers, they can take, it, take you through it. It's, it's a small fee up front. And then we split the commission with our partner on the ground 50-50. So it's completely transparent and, and it's a good question to ask. And that's exactly how it works. And as I said, the greatest thing about the pie strip is come along and uh, there's nothing to hide in terms of where we are.
Kim Bola asked, uh, Barker, sorry, asked the question, how does the taxation work in the U.S. for non-residents? Great question, Ken. As I said to you, just spent three hours yesterday again with Grant Thornton, one of our equity partners in Wealth Migrate. Uh, we've got a whole tax opinion, actually, from Grant Thornton. For those of you who don't know Grant Thornton, it's the uh, top five accounting firm in the world. Ian Scott is the managing partner of Grant Thornton in South Africa and uh, as a good friend of ours and, and, and as I said, is, is one of our business partners. And um, so if you are interested, I can let you know about that. But, uh, but there is a dual tax agreement between South Africa and, and the U.S. The reason I don't want to go into details is it's quite specific depending on who you are, what structure you, you set your properties up in, whether you bring the money back to South Africa, whether you hold it offshore, which bank account you hold it in, et cetera, et cetera. But we've got all those answers, Ken, and we've got the partners to be able to assist you with it. And then really, you know, for, for people that uh, are unsure, go and check it out. Go on YouTube. Just type in USA Buyers Trip. And every single person that's been on the buyer's trip, we ask them to give us a video, whether it's good or bad. We don't care. Um, we, we love going on the trips with people. We've met some wonderful people. And if you go on YouTube, you'll see all the different testimonials that are actually there. And really, just in terms of, again, why we recommend that people should come with us at the end of October, you get the right information. You come along. You're on the ground. Every All the great questions we've had tonight, you know, you get to spend you know more than eight days with us. And interestingly enough, one of the guys, Tony Delato, a very sophisticated entrepreneur on the trip in May, actually said to Brent and I, he said, this is the most information and the best experience he's ever had in eight days on a trip ever in his life in terms of learning experience. Imagine learning from people constantly for eight days. Every the question you've asked, do you want to ask about Belgium property, India property, Brazil property, why we invest, how we invest, why we've got the results? That's the information, not just about us, though. You've got the partners. You've got everyone on the ground. You've got the man in the street. You've got the taxi drivers. That's how you get the right information. You get to meet our partners in terms of who they are and what they are and what they do and basically why they're the best. You get to take action. As I said to you, we understand what it is you're looking for. We are not an estate agent. We don't have properties to sell. We understand what it is you're trying to achieve, and then we help you find solutions. We have lots of fun. And I'm sure that, uh, Brendan, uh, we've got a couple of pictures we can show people that. As I did say to people, meeting with caliber people like Henny, who literally has, uh, as I said to you, been, you know, he's worth millions and millions of rands here in South Africa, hundreds of millions of rands, actually, to be exact, all based in business and property. He's invested in the UAE, he's invested in Australia, and now he's investing with us in, in America as well. And um, I mean, just to reiterate, the man started in Australia four and a half years ago with $4 million. He turned it into $40 million in four years, listed the company. It's now worth $200 million. And really, you know, we've all got the privilege of working with them because really we're taking what worked in Australia and we cut copying paste and, and doing it again in America. And we actually believe the results will be better because the market in America is bigger and more sustainable. And then, as I said to you, Mega A partnering, you get to come along because Henny's presenting and talking at it. We've been given 10 VIP tickets and you get to come and, and network and meet the best in America in terms of property and business. So I believe a picture speaks a thousand words. If you are interested in anything about the USA Buyers Trip, just type in Buyers Trip. And even if you want to put your number in, you know, one of our guys can, can give you a shot. But I just want to show you some pictures of some of the trips. This was us in New York in February, minus 10 degrees. It was absolutely flipping freezing. Um, you can actually see Peter Jack there. He's one of the most sophisticated uh, construction guys in, in, uh, in the Western Cape and, and in South Africa. So again, the caliber of people that we get on these trips is, is really incredible. This was the trip in May, having fun in Leicester Square. Again, there's quite a few developers, a financier, an accountant, and, uh, and, and, and an entrepreneur there. And this is Leicester Square in New York. That has actually Dolph de Roos there. And this was Brendan and I were actually at the auctions in Phoenix. A lot of you have seen that, that show, Property Wars, and this is where we were actually uh, there, literally being involved in the auctions and, and trying to buy properties in Phoenix, although we decided the values weren't good enough and the partners weren't good enough, and so we ended up not buying. This is us having some fun. Uh, Marius, who, who started out as a client, now a good friend, Brent and myself, and going in a helicopter into the Grand Canyon. And I think this was us toasting down the bottom uh, on the Colorado River at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Going to see a show in Vegas, which was, which was magnificent. And then this was the tour in, I think, in October. And again, uh, buying properties in, in Atlanta. This was in February, again, buying properties um, in while we were there and the, and the crowd in terms of where we were at. We always get inside the properties. So this is in Orlando, actually. You've got to get inside. You've got to touch and feel and get experience for the finishers and the refurb, even, you know, in terms of what's happening. 
and this is us getting inside and looking at all the numbers and asking all the right questions. We help people go and open all their bank accounts. I often say to people it's easier to, to buy a gun than open a bank account, but we've now got all the right partners. We like to work with Wells Fargo and SunTrust. But, but uh, we've got all the right people now to be able to set it up and get all the bank accounts so that you're operational in terms of where you are. And then really the question is, where do you buy? Atlanta is a massive place. It's got over 5 million people. And, you know, so when you arrive, where do you buy? And interestingly enough, one of our competitors helps people invest inside the 285 because it looks a lot cheaper and, you know, the, the yields are better on paper. But no one invests inside the 285 because it's a very spotty area and, and the schooling and system is not good. And so we like to invest in the bedroom communities outside the 285. And this is RJ actually sitting down before we went out on the bus to be able to tell us where, why, why they invest in areas. And I found it incredibly endearing that um, when we met our finance partner and she came with us to Atlanta, she said they only finance outside the 285 because that's where the best markets are. That's where the most sustainable, stable markets are. And I thought it was really, really you know, pat on the back to our partners and, and also to ourselves for finding those partners that we were helping our investors invest in the best properties. Because, you know, chasing the highest yield and the highest return is not always the best idea. We're much more interested in safety, wealth preservation and quality. And uh, every place we go to, we organize a dinner so that you get to meet all our partners, the inspection agent, the management agent, the lawyer, the accountant, every single person involved in the transaction. The reason we do it over dinner is we don't have time all day to go to all their offices. So we bring them all to dinner. We can ask them questions. We get to know who they are so that when you go home, you know the full team. This is another dinner in one of the other cities. So again, meeting with all the clients and all the different partners. Having fun on Beale Street. This is in Memphis where Elvis is from. Depending on what night you go there, there's anywhere from five to 30 bands playing. And we've had a hell of a lot of fun. Always joke with people. We try not to do too much property the next morning. Another dinner in Atlanta. So again, meeting all the different partners in terms of who was there. And this was actually on our last trip in uh, in Atlanta. Quite interesting enough, Emmanuel was from Malaysia. We had um, we had Adrian from Canada. We had Clive from Australia. We had Howard, who's a great construction guy here in uh, in Cape Town and, and was really good at helping people know what was good quality or not. This gentleman over here is 25 years old. He made $25 million US dollars at the age of 19. That's the caliber of people that we're getting. And, and this guy here, works for, um, has his own company, but works with the biggest architects and property funds in South Africa. So, you know, really exciting caliber people in terms of who comes. These are some apartments that we're looking at uh, and actually purchasing in Midtown in Atlanta, really close to the CBD, really good area. Really, it's a bit like the Santon of, uh, of Johannesburg. And, uh, but we don't just buy one-off apartments, we buy the entire building where we can control the HOA. So if any of this is interesting to you, just, just type in buyer's trip. Again, a picture of us having some fun outside uh, Wall Street with the bull in New York. You can see it was summer. It was nice and warm. And then Henny, myself, and John Chin went up to North Dakota. For those of you who don't know about North Dakota, it's one of the biggest geopolitical things that have, are, are changing around the world. Um, America will be self-sustainable from oil by 2017. They won't need OPEC at all. And uh, there'll be a net export about 2023. So we went up there to understand the market, to understand the opportunity. And this is the benefit of dealing with people like John and Henny and going and, and getting to network and find these areas. And we uncovered some phenomenal opportunity up there. And we're very bullish. And if you want to know why, guys like Warren Buffett have just invested $47 billion in the railway system there in terms of, you know, because we believe in a, in a gold rush, the person that makes money is not the person that mines gold, but the person that actually um, sells spades. And so we're going to sell spades. And, you know, when you understand what's happening in this market, it's phenomenal. And I would highly recommend everyone coming and checking it out. Because, again, when you're on the ground, it's much more tangible. You know, we had a meeting uh, with an asset manager two nights ago, and he was asking all the questions and how do you do this and why do you do this? You know, the beauty is with partners, Henny at the moment is doing a lot of the residential and commercial and industrial development around the Madupi power plant. He understands small towns that, that go through a boom cycle. He understands how to minimize the risk and how to make sure you don't get caught up in the supply and demand curve and what you do and how you do it. We also have lots of fun. This was Halloween last year, and we're going to be there for Halloween this year. So this was Halloween in New York. And then finally, we're finishing with Mega 8. As I said to you, the best in America, the best businessmen, the best property people. It's the number one, world's number one wealth uh, conference in terms of where we are. And because Henny's actually presenting, we've got those 10 VIP tickets, and we get to spend the weekend with Jack Welsh. 
uh, J.D. Fox and, uh, and you know, Donald, uh, Donald Trump's right-hand man. And, um, you know, there's a, a lot of really qualified people, some of the best business guys, and, and we get to spend the weekend with them and learn from them, which in my experience has been one of the greatest opportunities anywhere in the world to learn from the best. So what next? I would really speak to one of the asset managers, you know, just type in asset manager if it's something that interests you. Or, as we said, put in your number now. I can see people have literally put in their name and their number and the guys will be able to get back to you. As I said, you know, we want to speak to you, we understand what it is you're trying to achieve. Do you want to come on the trip? If you don't have the time, then we can do a mandate. We can be your ears and eyes on the ground. There's really two different options. We help clients both ways. If you want to call our number, obviously it's not open now, um, but during office hours, you've got our Joburg office and our Cape Town office. And then finally, for those of you who don't want to speak on the telephone, send us an email, biastrip at ipsinvest.com. The challenge we've got is that, uh, you know, obviously a lot of people want to come on this trip and, and particularly with mega partnering, and we've only got uh, four spots left. So there's not a lot of spots left. Unfortunately, it will become on a first come, first serve basis. And if we get too many people, it will just be on a timestamp thing. So who put their name in first? Who got hold of us first? Who phoned us first? Who sent the email first? It's the only fair way to do it. Um, we only want to deal with sophisticated people. We want to deal with sophisticated, like-minded people who have a common objective of creating global wealth. And I think for me, that is the most important thing. So if you are interested, just put down your name and one of our team members will either get back to you tonight or, or tomorrow morning. I know that we've, we've been a little bit overwhelmed with demand, but um, we will get back to you definitely within the next 24 hours and we'll understand what it is you're trying to achieve and then we'll be able to find you know solutions for you. So just as my interest, before I finish off with a little story, who here has any questions? Is there anything that uh, we haven't answered yet? Um, if you are interested, just put in bias trip and, and your name. If you've got any questions, just type them in and I'll be able to answer them. Michael says, I'm currently working in Slovakia. That's perfect, Michael. Um, as I said, um, Emmanuel and them came from Malaysia. It doesn't matter where you fly from. You just got to get to America if you want to come with us. And if you work in Slovakia and you can't get out of Slovakia, then you tell us what you're looking for. You, we, it's a formal document in terms of a mandate. And we go over there, we, your ears and eyes on the ground, and we help you while we're on the ground there. So really, I don't mind if you live in Slovakia or Pofada. It makes no difference to us. We, we're investors, and we can help you in terms of what your objectives are. So are there any questions? Has anyone got any questions? Anything we haven't answered? Anything that's important that's been left out? Brendan, is there anything from your side that I've left out? And see, he's got himself muted there. So. <laughs> well, if there's no questions, then uh, I always say that uh, if we, if we, if there's no questions, we either bored you to death or, or confused you to death. Let's uh, let's run a quick poll because polls are fun. Uh, it also sees uh, how many people are, are concentrating. So I want to launch this poll. Where have you invested? You know, you haven't invested yet. You've invested in South Africa. You've invested offshore, but but not yet in America. Or you've invested offshore, but uh, but uh, actually in America, including America. So let's just see here quickly. Um, I'm interested to see how many people and, and what their experience is. So we've got a lot of investors that have invested in South Africa. Um, quite a few that have invested in, in offshore and quite a few that have actually invested in America. I'm quite impressed, actually. So if I share those results quickly, you'll see them coming up. And... Uh, now, very few people have not invested. 76 in South Africa, 28 offshore, and 16% have invested in America. So that's that's fascinating, actually, in terms of where we are. There's one other one that I wanted to ask is, um, you know, are you ready to invest? You know, based on what you've heard and, and where you are, are you ready to invest? Yes, or I need more information, or no, I'm just interested. You know, you've heard a lot of the stuff, but uh, unfortunately, the only people that, that really get the results are the people that take action. and you can never minimize all the risks. You can get the right information and ultimately you've got to have the right system and the right partners to make the right decisions. But just as a matter of interest, in terms of those people, it's, it's pretty interesting seeing uh, the different numbers coming through there. So quite a few people saying yes, some people saying I need more information, some people even saying no, which is perfect. You know, not every, you know we, we're not for everybody um, and as no businesses. We're a private banking solution and as much as some people like to deal with Standard Bank, then they don't deal with investing. <laughs> We're invested. So um, you can see there the numbers. That's pretty interesting just in terms of uh, where we are. And then the last poll that I, I wanted to ask people is, um, 
if you were looking to invest, how much would you be looking to invest? You know, so in terms of the amount of capital you've got available, because the one thing with America is the properties transfer in, in you know two weeks basically, and we tend to tell South Africans four to six weeks, and the reason being is that we we tend to be too slow, but um, the Americans like to transfer stuff in two weeks, and so you need to be at, you know you need to have your capital available and have access to capital. But depending on what you've got and how much you want to invest, then we really have the solutions to be able to help you. And that's what I, you know, I know Brendan is the same as me. We pride ourselves on understanding what people are trying to achieve and then helping them find solutions right through from small residential houses where you need, you know, 300,000 Rand to be able to buy them right through to commercial office parks with $60 million. You know, so we've got the level of sophistication to be able to help people at, at different levels. So that's that's very interesting in terms of where people are and uh, what their what their amounts are and what they would like to invest. So I will uh, I'll just share the results there so people can see in terms of the people online tonight and, and where we actually are. So ladies and gentlemen, from my side, I can see there that there's a couple of questions that have come through. And um, uh, boom, boom, boom. Uh, for the purchase in the U.S., is the commission payable on purchase as well as the rental flows? So, Ken, in terms of commission, we only earn in terms of the purchase. Our partners do charge a management fee. Obviously, it's generally between 9 and 10%. But everything you will get will be in the cash flow. There's no surprises, rates, taxes, levies, insurance, maintenance, everything, uh, vacancies. It's all in our cash flows in terms of where we are. Um, how can we get a good idea of property values without going on the trip if the internet values are not reliable? That's a very good question, Francois. Uh, it comes down to comparative market analysis. It comes down to working with the partners. But most importantly, it comes down to the incomes and the replacement value. And that's really, for me, how, how you know what one does. And then really use us. We're going over. We've got Brendan and I going over on the 25th of October. We're spending nearly another three weeks there. So, you know, we, we can help you. I mean, that's what we do. We're sophisticated investors, and we like to share our knowledge and, 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 and show you, you know, what's happening on the ground. And then John has said, what is the minimum cash requirement to invest in property in the U.S.? John, I would say probably realistically about 300,000 Rand. Um, you know, that will get you a good uh, safe investment uh, where you've got yourself a bit of a safety buffer and you can get started in terms of buying a three bedroom, one bathroom home uh, with a decent rental yield. So, yeah, that, that, that'll give you an idea. Michael's given us uh, some details there, so that's perfect. We'll be able to get, get through to them. So if anyone's got any questions, bang them through. I want to finish off with a story so we can finish for the evening. And then if you've got any questions, just uh, fire them through and I'll answer them. But the story really comes back to my uncle. And uh, my uncle, at the age of 56, immigrated to Australia. But it's not as easy as that because he basically, when he immigrated, he was 56, so he's well beyond the 45 age group where you can get on a skills-based visa. He, and he bought his way into Australia. So he literally, you can buy your way into Australia. He bought a house in Australia in Brisbane for $1.8 million. He sent his kid to a private school. It happens to be churchy. And more importantly for me, he retired and therefore didn't have to work for an Australian. And for me, it sums up everything that, that I talk about in terms of freedom. But the question is, how did he do it? And the way that he did it was at the age of 30 in 1980, he opened his first offshore bank account. And it was that pre-planning that 23 years later allowed him the freedom to make whatever decisions he wants. Now, whether you think that he should have stayed in Africa or not, that's his choice. It's your choice, to be honest. But for him, he was making plenty of money. So it wasn't about the business. And this is even in 2003 in Zimbabwe. It was actually because his kid's teacher kept changing every term and there were no dentists left in Harare. And he finally decided this was not the environment he wanted to bring his children up. So he decided for the sake of his children, he'd move to Australia. But because he had pre-planned back in 1980, because he had taken some of his income and put it into first world assets with a first world income, it allowed him the freedom to make whatever decisions he wants. Now, he's an inspiration to me, and he's, a, he's one of the reasons that I'm so passionate about what I do. And it's one of the reasons why Brendan and myself and the rest of the team, Yaku and Ryan and Teresa and Kristen, are so adamant in terms of trying to teach people about their global wealth. It's why we explain what the Global Wealth Index is. It's why we explain what the long-term trends are in terms of the last 30 years, and also project forward in terms of the next 30 years. Ladies and gentlemen, we do it so that you too have the ability to make the freedom. But it all starts with taking action. It all starts with understanding that you need to create different solutions for different scenarios. And so just like my uncle, 
I really, truly hope that you've learned a lot tonight, that you at least have a thought process so that you can go out and you too can do something. Whether it's with us or not is irrelevant to me. But at least do something so that in the long term, you will have the freedom to make whatever decisions you want for yourself or for your family. That's what we're all about. We've really enjoyed having you online tonight. It's been awesome. Brendan, thank you for contributing. It's been awesome having so many of you online. It's been awesome, all the great questions. Really, the energy has been great. I apologize. I've gone on a little bit uh, longer. But, you know, when you get great questions, it's hard not to answer them. But most importantly, please go out there, invest with confidence, and create global wealth. And if you want us to assist you with it, just type in Asset Manager or get hold of us in terms of the contact details on the screen, and we will be able to assist you in terms of creating your global wealth. So if there are no more questions for the evening, I'm going to sign off. I'll wait online just for a little bit more. If there's any questions or anything you want us to help with, let us know. But as always, it's an honor and a privilege to share this information and this knowledge with people. And I really hope that as many of you come on the buyer's trip with us at the end of October, it's going to be the best buyer's trip ever. I cannot explain to you how much fun and how much value people get when they come with us on these buyer's trips. I truly think it's one of the greatest things that you can do for yourself is to invest a week of your life to invest a very small amount of money so that you've got the freedom to be able to make the big decisions in the future. So I look forward to seeing as many of you as possible on the trip. If not, give us those mandates so that we can assist you. And if nothing else, speak to one of the asset managers so that you can get the right information. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Have a lovely evening. Good night.